Hi and welcome back to a new video. I received a ton of hardware you can see on my table for a short testing period until I have to return it, but this is necessary to test this special 12900K which I bought on Hardware Looks forums. It was originally listed for 1250 euro, but it was open to bidding and I ended up, because I won the auction, I won it for 1400 euro which is certainly quite a lot more than what you would usually pay for a 12900K. Especially now keeping in mind that the 12900KS is probably knocking on the door, then the 12900K in the pricing should drop. But this was sold as a SP97 CPU, which is a rather high SP value. If you're not familiar with the SP, SP can be read out on Asus boards and it's basically, it's called Silicon Prediction. It was originally called Silicon Quality until Intel pushed Asus to rename this feature. What it's doing, it's reading out different VID values. So you have like a turbo VID, a non-turbo VID, then you have the P-Core VID, the E-Core VID, and then they made some kind of formula to transform all those VIDs into a value you can easily read out. But you could also just go ahead and just compare VIDs. It would be the same result. But what I was wondering about is, is it really worth spending so much money on heavily binned CPUs, especially like this heavily binned? And is just judging by the SP value really worth it? I guess it's not worth it. I guess I just paid way too much for the CPU, but uh, we will find out. Yeah, I have the C690 Aros Master to test. We already tested the C690 Aros Extreme a few weeks ago, but in this video I didn't find the time to also remove the VRM heatsink. That's something I want to do in today's video. I also received this Aros Gen 4 7000 series SSD, which is also something I never tested before. I saw that changed the heatsink. This could have a positive impact on thermals, even though I'm not sure about the heatsink cover, but yeah, we will get to all of this today. Also received this M34WQ, which is a UWQHD, something in this direction. It's a 21 to 9 aspect ratio monitor, 1440p, 144Hz. Maybe not that special, but yeah, I will check it out as well. On the Aros Master, one of the first things I want to do is remove the heatsink, just to check out like how is it looking underneath. But I was also wondering about, there is this massive cover above which is like semi-transparent and you can look through it, you can see the heatsink underneath. I was wondering if removing this could further improve temperatures. Not sure about that. Also, I mean, a lot of the things on the Aros products are like covered thermally. Not sure how much sense this makes, especially looking at this SSD, for example. Comparing this with the previous gen from Aros SSDs, it has a drastic improvement of surface area, but then like 50% seems to be covered by this. I'm not sure. Yeah, might make sense to test this. Compared to the Aros Extreme, the heatsink on the SSD is a bit different. It's not using any kind of heat pipe and like thin fins, but still the surface area on this thing is enormous. This should be more than anything what you would need for any kind of SSD. Okay, Sheik, thank you very much. Sheik, could you please? Thank you. One thing that's a bit annoying though is the fact that you cannot just plug and play one of these SSDs. In the previous version it, it came disassembled, so the heatsink was not on there. But like right now you can see there's a like a thick thermal pad underneath and you have this like casing. If you would try to plug this in here, it just wouldn't fit. Because you have this other shield sitting underneath with the thermal pad and this would have to be kind of removed to fit in here which does not work because I think it's also soldered to the PCB over this pin. Which also means that if you would like to use this, you would have to remove the SSD out of the original casing, which I think is a, a good thing to do. Otherwise, remove this cover probably and just like leave this away and rely on the original cooling. Okay, I was partially wrong here. Removing this screw allows to remove this bracket, which then, if you put it back, allows to plug the SSD here. So this also works. You will straight notice on the back side, no doublers on the back. It's actually quite simple to remove the cover itself. It's only fixed by a screw on the bottom, a screw on top. 
And then underneath the heatsink is massive. I was just wondering if there is also a fan sitting underneath, but seems to be not the case. Yes, yeah, so as you can see, there is no fan sitting underneath anywhere. It's just a huge heatsink. It's really enormous. The finish is also great. It's like some very rough black aluminium finish. Feels great and also also looks pretty pretty high quality. Now that the heatsink is gone, we can also look at the faces themselves. That's what we didn't do on the Extreme, but it's the same type of VRM solution. That's the same you can find on a lot of C690 boards nowadays. It's the famous RAA229131 controller, which can natively control up to 20 faces. And that's also what we have on here. 19 of those faces are responsible for CPU vCore. And that's just amazing. That's what I would wish for and that's pretty much perfect. Spent some time setting the setup, installed Windows and all these kind of things. You can see the SSD is now using the stock cooler and also the VRM cooling in this condition is totally exposed without the cover. Right now I'm also using this opportunity to test the storage benchmark inside a 3D mic. Never used this before. As you can see, I kept Hardware Info open for about 30 minutes so far. It has been open the entire time when I installed all the tools like 3D mic and everything. But you can also see that the peak read and write rates are so much below anything that would justify a generation 4 NVMe drive. This is like half the speed of the maximum of generation 3. And the maximum peak temperature right now is 51 degrees Celsius. Now, if we just look at this number from the 3D Mark storage benchmark with almost 3,500 points, this is definitely in the upper region. So just judging by the database of 3D Mark, that's a good result. Not sure how much information I can get out of those megabyte per second read values about the gaming benchmarks. What I find a bit strange though is looking at hardware info, which I kept open during the entire benchmark, the read and write rates were never maxed out and the temperature is still max 51. If we just start a crystal disk mark in sequential read-write, just to max out also the read and write performance, you can straight see it jumps up to 7000 megabyte per second on read. Just waiting for the write test. Also drive temperature should increase now. It's already at 45 degrees Celsius. But I think doing like maybe 20 or 30 sequential read-write tests should be sufficient to test the thermal performance of the heatsink. It's now going over to the write test, as you can see. The write performance is also exactly where it should be at 6000 megabyte per second. We're closing in on 27 sequential read-write tests in total. The performance is still there. You can see it right with the write test. It's still just below 6000 megabyte per second, while the temperature is now getting to 66 degrees Celsius peak. After a few more seconds, you can see it peaked out at 68 degrees Celsius. That's why I was asking myself the question, if we remove the cover right here, it should expose a good amount of surface area in addition. It's still quite warm and that should help removing this cover part because I think it's just glued right on. The SSD is now back in the system. I spent about 15 minutes in idle just to make sure that the temperature is level. Compared to previously, the lowest what we saw before was about 42 degrees Celsius, which is now 38. But let's repeat the 27 tests and then we will be back. Now that the test is over, we have a peak temperature of 62 degrees Celsius. But now if we want to switch to the main board cooling solution, also interesting. As you can see, if this is correctly set, the thermal pad for the backside doesn't even make contact with the SSD. Because this is a single sided SSD, basically, so no components on the back, which means that you would need a completely different thermal pad with double the thickness in order to make any kind of contact. I have the feeling the video will be quite long, but it doesn't matter because there are so many good things we want to test. Starting off with the SSD temperature, just a summary. With the stock heatsink, max temperature is 68 degrees Celsius. Removing the tiny cover on here gives you a temperature drop of 6 degrees Celsius to 62 peak, which is some like form over function thing again, but then also thinking about, I'm not even sure why the heatsink is included in the first place, because typically you would use such a heatsink on a board that typically also comes with an additional heatsink, like 
any high-end Aorus board will already have an SSD heatsink. And if you use the one that's included in the Aorus Master, it will drop your temperatures by 20 degrees Celsius to a peak of 48, which is then quite cold and also literally quite cool. The first test on this 12900K looks kind of decent. At least I could pass 5.2 GHz without a lot of trouble. The core voltage in idle is 1.28 while it's dropping down to about 1.27 under load using LLC Turbo in Gigabyte BIOS. You can see on the score 11,200 points which is totally in line. However, the temperature is rather high. You can see 97 degrees Celsius on one core peak which is definitely caused by a peak power consumption of 306 watt. What you just saw in these screen captures was that you could see some kind of weird patterns like stripes going across the monitor that is caused by the individual combination of this camera and monitors like this. That's why we had to figure out over the years what kind of monitor works to film from the monitor itself. To me personally, using a 4K 144 Hz with a lower sized monitor like ideally 27 to like 30 inch that's typically the region which is great to film from the monitor itself but if I use this one for example with 34 inches then the pixel density is too high for this camera to have some kind of like beautiful screenshots then we would have to go for some real screen capturing with like recording the like HDMI and stuff but that's typically just too much work and then you're also typically downgrading to 60 Hertz instead of 144 which is then also a bit annoying just to explain why the image looked the way it did now talking about the SP97 CPU, it's generally a CPU which is definitely in the upper 5% just from the clock. But I also want to add that the e-cores on this CPU are not great. They can only run 4.1 and that's already on the edge. 4.2 always fails Prime95 after like 20 minutes and 4.3 always immediately crashes even with higher voltage. So the e-cores on the CPU are not that great but the P-cores are quite solid. The setting I found now for AIO cooling are using 1.2 volt for 5.1 gigahertz. And I ran this eight hours through Prime95 because I basically forgot to disable the testing overnight, which is then still great. But you can also run 5.2 at about 1.28 V-core, but I would definitely go for custom water cooling for 5.2 because the power consumption is rather high, temperatures are rather high and you will have better stability using lower temperatures. But considering I'm using an AIO, it's definitely a good CPU. But just buying by SP value might not be the best option. Just going for individual testing, then you also know what kind of cache frequency and what kind of e-core frequency you can expect. So that's the setting I would use for this 12900K. 5.1 on the P cores, as you can see, and 4.1 on the E cores, running 4.3 on the cache. 4.4 can pass Cinebench several times, but it will fail in Prime95. And 4.5 on the cache will immediately fail on Cinebench. But also comparing this to the 5.2 GHz version with higher V core, you can see it's about 60 watt less power draw. And also the temperatures are much nicer. So we're in the region of Typically 80 to 85 degrees Celsius peak was 87. Considering that's an AIO, that should be perfectly cool for the temperature region, expecting about like 60 to 65 degrees Celsius during gaming. Now that we know the stable clocks for our 12900K, the stable setting, I want to repeat the testing for about 20 minutes, check VRM temperature without the cover, and then repeat again with the cover and see if there's any kind of impact because there is this huge IO cover. After a warm up phase of about Five minutes, I kept running this for almost 18 minutes now. The VRM temperature, as you can see, is peak 76. Didn't change for the last maybe like five to six minutes. Seems to be maxed out now at 76 degrees. While the CPU was drawing 278 watt on average for almost 20 minutes, which is quite a lot. Now the question will be what will happen to the VRM temperature if we put the cover back on. I also adjusted the fan speed of the AIO manually to 2000 RPM. It's a bit more noisy, but that's also necessary to be able to cool 280 watt constantly. Now with a nice looking cover back in place, interestingly 78 peak. So it's only two degrees Celsius difference. 
I definitely had a wrong assumption looking at the cover because I thought it's covering so much of the surface area or like airflow from the top, but the impact was almost not there. I mean, two degrees Celsius, that's something you can absolutely neglect. And also, if you think about that I'm running open test bench without any directed airflow, then in a case, this certainly won't matter at all because then you maybe have like 15 degree less on the VRM anyway. So I think using the cover, totally fine, no negative impact there at all. That's something I did not expect. So there is one more topic, which in my eyes is extremely important and not many people are talking about this. Apart from just going by VID and SP value, there is also the leakage. And the leakage is so important for these kind of CPUs. I did a quick test with a random second 12900K. Both CPUs were running the identical configuration. 1.30 volt, 5.1 gigahertz on the P cores, 4.1 on E, 4.1 on cache. The random CPU consumed an average of 275.4 watt during the R20 run, while the good CPU, the SP97 CPU, consumed 303 watt on average. That is an increase by 10%, 30 watt almost. That is enormous. And that's something I'm not sure why these days nobody is really taking care of this anymore. Back then, like 775 times, people were paying attention to the leakage because the leakage is very important, especially for extreme overclocking. A CPU like this one, the SP97 CPU with a very high leakage is typically a CPU which is very good for extreme overclocking because these are the CPUs that scale very well with temperature. At least that's what we learned over the past I'm not sure if that's the same for this CPU. I'm not sure about that yet, but I will definitely test this CPU on liquid nitrogen to find out. But you have to keep in mind that individual CPUs, apart from having completely different VIDs, they also have completely different internal resistances and leakage. And just looking at this case, this also explains why some people are complaining about high temperatures and others are not so much complaining about high temperatures because 30 watt that is a significant difference. And 30 watt difference can also turn your CPU into be 10 degrees warmer than the other CPU because you're running really on the edge. And that's also what reviewers have to keep in mind because I always see, and that's something that annoys me, I always see comparisons of individual CPUs. For example, a reviewer is taking a 11900K, one CPU, and compares it with one 12900K and then draws the conclusion then that CPU X is so much war warmer than CPU Y and also consumes more power or less power. But just looking at a single sample, this will not give you a good conclusion. And that's what you have to keep in mind. And especially for binning, that's also a factor which is very important. So going by SP is a very good indicator to find a CPU which needs low V-core. That definitely works out. But at the same time, you will have to pay attention to additional factors like temperature and also power draw. It's very important. There is one thing I almost forgot to mention and that's the 12900KS. And historically speaking, looking at the 9900KS and the 9900K, if you were back then and binning CPUs, 9900Ks, one or two months before the KS came to the market, it was pretty difficult to find decent 9900K CPUs. And that could also be the case right now. I think it's very likely that Intel is holding back the very good 12900K CPUs right now to build the KS, which would make absolute sense. So right now it's maybe also bad timing for like binning yourself. But if you're looking at like public markets and looking for good CPUs, going for silicon quality, also obviously because the CPU has been laying around here for several weeks, the value of the CPU I think dropped drastically and I think it's maybe now like, I don't know what the real value of this is, maybe like 800 or 900 with a high silicon quality or silicon prediction. But now I think you can also find CPUs with like 105 or 110 SP and then they would maybe be in the same price region as this one. Just a few more words on the binning. Okay, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>